glad to have now Alisa Knight uh, for a talk about playing with fire, hacking fire and mobile health API. Let's have a big, like a warm online applause for Alisa <laughs> to come on stage. Hello, Alisa. How are you? Hi, Mehdi. Thank you very much. And I want to say thank you to you and Baptiste and the rest of your colleagues uh, for the Women in APIs initiative. That's amazing. I I'm so happy you guys are doing that. Yeah, it's it's just a start, right? It's, it's the drop in the ocean, but uh, an ocean is made out of drops. So yeah, it's one of them. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, thank you very much. We need it. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for being this opening keynote speaker for day two. We love your setup, right? <laughs> thank you setup. very much. <laughs> and I invite you to play with fire with us <laughs> and, and share your content. And the stage is yours, Alisa. Awesome. Thank you, Mehdi. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on what part of the world you're in. Thank you for joining me this uh, this morning. Um, I am going to be talking about my vulnerability research into hacking fire APIs. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about myself and why you should listen to me. Uh, I'm going to talk about the research definitions. Uh, those are just some important industry terms that I had to learn while walking into this. I'm going to talk about smart versus fire, HL7 and fire history, uh, fire version for resources and the RESTful API, smart authorization authentication, uh, our test fire app uh, that was developed by Skip Hobsmith over at Approve, uh, sponsors of this research, testing phases and my phase one findings and phase two findings. Now, um, one of the first things that I want to do is just quickly, you know, uh, offer for all of you to reach out to me. Uh, if you have any questions, definitely one, one of the most common questions I get is how do we support you and your content? How do we support content creators? The best way you can support us is to like and share our content, subscribe to our you subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter and connect with me on LinkedIn. So I'm a recovering hacker of 21 years. Uh, I'm also a recovering entrepreneur. I've actually started and sold multiple companies. Uh, I've published uh, two, actually, uh, my first book was Hacking Connected Cars, which was published by Wiley. And I'm working on a new book, Hacking and Securing APIs, which will come out in 2022, early 2022. Uh, I started and sold two previous companies, as I mentioned. I also started a venture capital fund. I now run M&A Night Capital with my wife, M&A Night Entertainment and Night Inc., I'm also a cybersecurity filmmaker and content creator. And my API hacks over the last few years include 30 financial services, mobile apps in 2019 and APIs, 30M health apps and APIs in 2020. In that same year, I also published research on hacking federal and state law enforcement vehicles through APIs. And if any of you are interested, there is a very cool video on that on my YouTube channel. Check it out. Uh, there's several videos. And the neat thing is law enforcement actually uh, permitted me to film a documentary uh, on my research and the taking remote control of their law enforcement vehicles and their fleet. So you can find some very cool videos on that on my YouTube channel, as well as in now this year, I'm focused on hacking fire APIs and also believe it or not, hacking connected trains. So, you know, I'm a big believer that everything today is, is uh, communicating with APIs. It's really become the fabric of the global economy and everything that's connected now on the internet of everything communicates with APIs as all of you know. So I just wanted to talk about for a moment, um, sponsors of the research. This is how it really came to be is uh, I'm a content creator. So I work with uh, cybersecurity vendors, specifically challenger brands and market leaders in cybersecurity to create content for them, uh, whether it's visual content through videos or written content through uh, white papers. So uh, I did want to mention that this research really was born out of my client, Approve, uh, who makes an API security solution. And they really wanted me to actually, as part of that uh, content, go after and hack healthcare APIs. So this is the product of that. So let's quickly go into smart versus fire and what what is the difference between the two? Because I think these two terms tend to become easily inflated, uh, sorry, conflated. So, uh, you know, smart on fire, uh, smart and fire are actually two separate things. So first of all, fire basically provides a set of models to standardize the representation of clinical concepts. Um, this is, this can include allergy information, medication information, and an EHR. So it's basically the, the formatting of the data, I guess you can say. 
Smart standardizes the process through which third party applications can plug into that data store and access that clinical information. So it basically acts as a security layer uh, that sits on top of those fire interfaces. Now, one thing that many of you will recognize is OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. So Smart basically layers this on top of fire. Um, so basically, if you think about it, Fire standardizes the data while Smart standardizes and secures data access. So that's really the best way that, that you can look at it. Uh, again, they're two separate things. Now, a lot of people think hackers just kind of walk into things just knowing all about it, right? So, you know, wh whenever I speak at conferences, uh, people will uh, come up to me and ask me questions when I get off stage and, go, oh, you know, you must have known everything about vehicular mechatronics when you started hacking connected cars. No, I had to learn a lot walking into it. Same thing with fire. There is a lot of terminology in healthcare that I needed to familiarize myself with. Um, you know, but one of the things that I it just is really nerdy about me is I like to dig into the history of things. And the interesting thing here is that um, HL7 actually goes back many decades. Uh, this the first known health IT system was implemented in 1960. Uh, in 1987, HL7, HL7 version one arrived. Now I want you to all understand something. HL7 is the creator of fire, but HL7 international, the organization, Health, Le Health Level 7 International is an international standards organization, but the standard is actually also called HL7, uh, which predated FHIR, which was HL7 version one, version two. So this is the timeline for that, right? So HL7 version two arrived in 1989 on the scene. Um, I won't go into too much, uh, to go too much into this timeline, but basically uh, CDA came out in 2005, HL7 launched FHIR in 2014, uh, Boston Children's Hospital got involved, that's where uh, SMART actually originated, and in 2016, this is when we saw uh, the U.S. government it, with the 21st Century Cures Act. It basically made APIs a requirement for certified health IT or HIT. Health IT is another acronym you'll see me use, and that arrived in 2016. So um, moving on, again, in uh, 26, I think I had a typo on that date there, but um, in uh, 2016, also SMART uh, was released on the fire specification. The JSON task force recommended public APIs for healthcare. Basically, the JSON task force came along and said, yeah, healthcare is really messed up. We really need to fix this. Um, the Argonaut project also in 2016 uh, launched to implant SMART in EHRs. And then uh, again, the 21st Century Cures Act made APIs a requirement for HIT, incorporating language from SMART team. Uh, from the smart team. So this is really all, when it all really started to formalize. Uh, Cerner launched Smart on Fire Developer Sandbox. And then in 2017, All Scripts and Epic launched Smire on Fire Developer Sandbox as well. In 2018, Apple came on the scene and incorporated Smart into its health app. Um, I won't go, again, I, I only have 30 minutes, so I have to kind of rush through this. Um, in 2019, CMS committed to smart bulk data specs. The interesting thing in 2019 is Microsoft also launched smart on fire APIs in its Azure product. And then fast forward to 2020, the final rule on ONC specified smart as universal apps API to implement 21st Century Cures Act. So that happened in 2020. And yes, there are deadlines for that. And there are uh, penalties around information blocking. Okay, so let's quickly cover Fire version 4.01, which is the current version of Fire. I don't know if any of you can see all of this, but basically on the right hand side, you're going to see all of the Fire version 4 resources. These are things um, covering like medications, diagnostics, um, care and provision, basically billing and all that other fun stuff. These are all resources. Uh, within Fire. Again, it is a RESTful API. On the left-hand side, uh, you'll see all of those uh, interactions as well as the verbs that are supported. So again, Fire is a REST API. Smart authorization and auth authentication, this is how it implements that authorization. So here, I don't know if you can see my mouse arrow, but um, uh, over here, you've got the application or the API consumer. 
Um, that's basically sending the API request to the data holder, which is the hospital clinic, basically the healthcare provider. And those uh, requests, of course, hopefully uh, becoming uh, or being authorized properly. So not only just authenticated, uh, and here's a flow chart of how that authentication authorization happens, but not just authenticated, but hopefully also authorized. Now, uh, this is a screenshot from the Fire app that was developed by Skip Hopsmith over at, uh, at Approve for my research, for my vulnerability research. And in this here, you see a screenshot of provided from the Firestarter app um, for the uh, smart IT demo site. So the, it, this actually connects to two of the major EHR companies that supported this research and worked very closely with me and have been awesome, by the way, in supporting this research. I do want to thank them for that. They've been very helpful in me getting acclimated uh, to this new world. And uh, this client basically has a pull-down menu allowing me to select which EHR I want to attack. Okay, so let me quickly go into the testing phases of my research. Uh, in phase one, we have basically the static code analysis. Um, that's basically where I started with reverse engineering the mobile apps. These are the non-fire APIs that transmit, process, and store EHI. This began in 2020. Uh, I'm going to show you the results from that vulnerability research. Once I was done with static code analysis of the app, I then moved on to traffic analysis, where I performed what I like to call woman in the middle attacks or widom attacks um, on uh, the traffic going from the from the uh, API client to the backend API. Next uh, was the fuzzing stage, where I actually used fuzzing tools against the APIs. And I do want to pause and take a moment to tell all of you how important it is to fuzz your APIs. Uh, so one of the things that I, I can't stress enough is, you know, with, with API hacking, it's not like it's as simple as being able to just throw uh, a Nessus vulnerability scanner at it and find vulnerabilities. With, with hacking APIs, you're taking different approaches uh, such as testing for the OWASP API security top 10, which are the top 10 vulnerabilities published by OWASP uh, affecting APIs. Uh, one of the most important findings uh, as it relates to vulnerabilities for me has been finding those through fuzzing. Now uh, in phase two, which began this year uh, is static code analysis, um, which I'm actually in the process of at the moment as well as traffic analysis where I'm doing net traffic interdiction between the browser client. So again, phase two with Fire, there's a lot more usage of browser for the API client. So I'm actually doing network interdiction on that as well as those Fire apps that uh, APIs that support mobile apps. So again, this sort of uh, incorporated a new kind of attack surface, if you will, with web browsers. And I am gonna talk about that. Uh, there's a very cool product called Burp Suite from a company called Port Swigger. And there's a free community edition that you can download. But one of the really cool things about Burp is there's a button that allows you to actually load Chromium and it automatically puts all the packets from your traffic going to the APIs into Burp Suite for you to replay and send to repeater, send to intruder, all of the other modules that are supported within Burp Suite. It makes things really easy. I'm all about that easy button. Uh, so this is phase two. And again, uh, moving on to fuzzing the APIs as well. Okay. So phase one, again, was where I went after the healthcare providers, uh, payers, the hospitals, uh, and their, their custom-built APIs. Now, I want to make this abundantly clear. Yes, you'll see company logos there. That does not mean Cerner operates those hospitals or Epic operates those hospitals. It simply just means it's an example of me showing you how the different hospitals uh, will use different EHI systems or EHR systems. Uh, in this diagram I created, you'll see the patient at the top. And uh, so if the patient goes to this hospital and the hospital is using Cerner as their EHR, 
that patient can go to a completely different hospital and that hospital won't be able to grab their records from this system over here because they're using Epic. This is the crux of the problem that Fire really, uh, HL7 really set out to solve for. And this is really uh, what it is that's the, that I'm targeting. So here I am, the hacker, uh, targeting those APIs at those individual hospitals. And these were my findings. So for those of you who are not familiar with the OWASP API Security Top 10, if there's any developers in the audience, I would definitely familiarize yourself with these vulnerabilities. Go check it out. Just Google it. It's the OWASP API Security Top 10. And the four most common vulnerabilities, this is not to say there weren't other vulnerabilities, but the four most common in my testing has been what are called BOLA vulnerabilities or broken object level authorization vulnerabilities, also formally referred to as IDOR or insecure direct object reference vulnerabilities. Uh, the second was broken user authentication where I didn't even need to authenticate to access uh, thousands of patient records that I wasn't able to, that I should have been able to access, excessive data exposure vulnerabilities and mass assignment vulnerabilities. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here, but here is a screenshot. These are redacted screenshots of my findings. Yes, you saw it here first at API days, <laughs> but um, here's my architecture diagram. Uh, basically, I've got my mobile app here and uh, you can see, welcome Dr. Alyssa Knight. Here's the patients you should have access to. Um, so this is my request to the API and it's sending back that specific patient record. And then what I did with my hacker's workstation was I basically intercepted that traffic and then um, I'm sure many of you, since this is an API conference, are very familiar with Postman. Absolutely love Postman. Um, great company, great product. Um, when you, when I need a tool to actually create an API request from scratch, meaning not interdiction and copying and pasting, but just create something from scratch, I'll use Postman. So I'll, I'll use a number of different tools and I'll go over my war chest with you later, but um, this is my tool for creating packets from scratch. Um, so I'll take the, the packets that I intercepted, paste them into Postman, and then send the same request to the API, removing my token, removing my key, trying different um, records uh, and what are called object IDs that I was requesting. And I found that I was able to request patient records that I shouldn't have been able to see. So here you'll see um, some redacted patient records. Here's a screenshot behind here. Sorry, I couldn't fit all the screenshots on a single slide, but you can see API keys and tokens hard coded in the app. You can see me interdicting that traffic, even though it was SSL encrypted. Um, the reason I was able to see this SSL encrypted data, you're probably thinking, Alyssa, that's not possible. How could you see it? It was SSL encrypted. Well, the reason why is because I was using a man in the middle attack or woman in the middle attack tool called Midim Proxy. Uh, also, Burp Suite has the same capability, but it basically will sit in the middle of that session and basically send a uh, certificate to both sides of the conversation. One certificate will go to the API, the other certificate will go to the client, and the client will think it's communicating with the server, the API endpoint, and the API will think it's communicating uh, with the client. It's not, it's really communicating with me. I'm capturing that traffic, decrypting it because I have the certificates, and then I can play. Stealing pathology reports. So again, the neat thing about um, Postman that I really love is, I and this was new for me, I actually didn't know it had this capability. So Postman, if any of your employees are in the audience, great tool, absolutely adore you guys and gals. Um, but this is me intercepting that traffic. I requested, um, once I intercepted the traffic, I requested this particular URI from the endpoint. And then once I requested that URI, I got back this PDF file and I was like, oh, wow, look at that PDF header. I bet you I can store that to a file somehow. And sure enough, um, Postman has this really cool capability to save that response to a PDF file. And here you can see the actual rendering where I stored that PDF file to my Mac and um, was able to actually download this uh, actual EHR record uh, for this patient. And this is an actual hospital admissions record. Um, these are screenshots of hard-coded APIs and tokens. Guys and gals, 
if your if your developers stop doing this, <laughs> stop doing it, please. Um, if you're going to store API secrets in the app, you you need to use obfuscation. You need to understand how easy it is for me to grab the APK with APK extractor and go in there and actually reverse engineer it back to the source code and actually comb through it. This is simply me. Um, my preference is to use grep at the command line, but to grep the um, output once it's been decoded and then, um, uh, sorry, reverse engineered uh, back to its source code and then comb through it with grep to find these keys and tokens. I have actually found hard-coded usernames and passwords. Shame on you developers, stop doing that too. Um, and also a lot of these API keys and tokens were for third parties, like payment processors. Um, yeah. So uh, if you want to see the full-blown screenshots, all of my research is being published at the approved website. So get, go take a look at, download the report. It's a very cool report, by the way, if I should say so myself. So one of the hospitals... Um, had a very vulnerable API, and I was able to actually request those hospital records and download them. So you, a lot of you need to understand something that that EHR records, PHI, protected healthcare information, is worth a thousand times more on the dark web than a single U.S. credit card number. So it's 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 absolutely astronomical in value. And there, I think the reason why I can only surmise. Uh, on this, but I opine that the reason is because of how much data is a sing in a single uh, EHR record or PHR record. Um, it's a lot easier for me to issue you a new credit card if your credit card has been compromised. I just send you a new one in the mail, right? Well, if I've compromised your your personal health information, if I've compromised your health data, your historical health data, how do I reset that? How do I send you a new health record in the mail? I can't. You can't reset that. Once it's out there, once it's breached, it's breached. I think that's why it's worth so much on the dark web. But um, this was, uh, folks, tens of thousands of patient records um, at this hospital. A lot of the patient records included photos um, of the patients. So uh, this is really bad stuff. Um, uh, the record, the report um, for my research has ga has gone uh, garnered a lot of widespread attention. Uh, there's been it's hit every major news headline. Uh, it's also I found out was also referenced by several congressmen uh, on Capitol Hill about insecurities in our healthcare uh, system. This is a real problem. Uh, so I really appreciate. Medi and and Baptiste and and all of their colleagues Yvonne uh, for inviting me here to talk about this problem. <clears throat> okay, <laughs> this is <laughs> this was really shocking. Um, I don't know if you can see this, Yvonne. Thanks. I think you're zooming in and out for me on these slides. Thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> but this was shocking uh, for you developers in the audience who are familiar with JSON and stuff. Look at the screen on the left. You can see that it's it's blurred, but what I found, so what happened here was with this particular EHR system, you know how on an iPhone you can uh, it, you can unlock your screen with face ID? Okay. Well, this EHR system basically implemented this API implemented an unlock feature where if I unlock my iPhone, it sends the secret key or seek I guess we'll call it a key, the secret key. Uh, to the API endpoint, and it unlocks the session. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you can see the date stamps here. This is really hard to see. I can I can tell, but um, again, there's a blown up screenshot in the report. <coughs> but if you if you look at this, I I sent the request and I didn't realize. <coughs> Jesus, excuse me, sorry. I'm like choking over here. I had a bagel right before this presentation, so I I apologize. Um. So what happened was I unlocked the session with my face and I saw, and I recorded the packet and I saw that the token that it sent this key. And then like a few weeks later, I came back and I unlocked my session again <clears throat> and I, I saw the same key, right? So you developers know what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> this company hard coded the key in the, in the API app, in the client, API client. And, and so it was sending the same key every time I unlocked it. 
So what what happened what happens there then, right? As the attacker, I can just copy and paste that key months later, years later, and you know, as long as you've got that session information and you've got that key, you just replay it. And I and on the right hand side, you can see me replaying that session key. Uh, sorry, that same key, and it gave me back all the healthcare data. So as long as I unlock that session uh, with that special token or key, I don't even know what to call it. Let's just call it a password. Once I resent that that password back to the API, it actually unlocked the session again. And this was like months later, everybody. And I was able to re re actually take over that session or grab that session and um, as the attacker and request those records. Okay, so playing with fire. As you can see, fire, F-H-I-R, has many puns available for it. So that was the name of this research. Okay, so one of the things that I want to really clearly explain here is that there's certified and non-certified HL7 Fire APIs. Okay, so they're certified and non-certified. Uh, there are no certified Fire APIs right now. Again, this is you know there's deadlines associated, looming deadlines associated with all this. But um, uh, certified APIs is coming. One of the HR vendors said that they were committed to certifying this year and being the first company to certify it. Um, but uh, so basically that's really kind of what we have here is, is in this architecture diagram, you'll see um, this hospital over here running Epic, this hospital over here running Cerner and having certified fire APIs that talk to each other. So this patient can go to either hospital and, um, and uh, uh their data is shared. All right. I also need to make sure make sure this is abundantly clear so Cerner and Epic don't get mad at me. <laughs> Cerner and Epic may be watching right now, so let me make this clear. Um, I just because I'm using their logo it doesn't mean any of these vulnerabilities are associated with them. There's non-attribution. There's I'm not saying that they have anything to do with any of this. I'm just giving all of you an example, all of you girls and guys, an example of the different EHR systems that these hospitals can be running. Next in this diagram, you'll see a non-certified Fire APIs in this hospital is running Epic, Cerner, but they're both running Fire APIs and those Fire APIs are talking to each other, but they're just not certified. That is the current state today, right? Because no one has certified Fire APIs, but moving forward, there's going to be this concept or this idea of, of certified APIs. Um, so for purposes of my report and reporting on my vulnerabilities, um, sorry, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. I know we're coming very quickly uh, to the end, um, so I'll try and hurry this up. I don't want to make Baptiste and Medi mad at me. Uh, provider uh, not on fire. So these are the individual hospitals that are running uh, their their uh, EHR systems um, and just the running their own custom APIs, um, right? So you know, no, not fire APIs, but just custom APIs that they wrote. Now let me talk about the attack lab setup. So the attack lab setup. Um, with my web APIs, I use Burp Suite, and there's two modules within there, which is proxy and repeater. So I'll ca I captured the packets within proxy, and then I right-clicked on those packets and then sent them to repeater. Um, with the mobile API attack lab, I'm using MobSF. All of you can go out and download that. It's a free open source tool, very cool platform. It literally is web-based and allows you to just drag and drop your um, Android packages uh, into those AP key files into MobSF, and then it takes care of all the decoding, decryption, reverse engineering, all that fun stuff. Anyway, uh, so basically reverse engineers it. Sorry, I shouldn't say the word decryption. It reverse engineers it back to its original source. Uh, Minim proxy and Postman burp suite, uh, proxy repeater, APK extractor, and Android OS. Uh, on my, my general tools that I use when I'm attacking APIs is fuzzers. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Rustler, and that is a, uh, a, a, a Rustful API fuzzer that was made by Microsoft. FFUF, fuff, I don't know how to pronounce it, fuff, uh, Content Discovery with Kite Runner, which is an amazing tool. I love Kite Runner. And then uh, my platform is Mac OS. For instrumenting my API attacks, I really kind of go through this reconnaissance phase and then testing. In reconnaissance, I'm doing traffic analysis, like I mentioned. Um, there's a great tool. Um, and this is all mind map, mind mapped from a gentleman named David Sopas. And uh, he's at, at DSopas. He did an amazing mind map on this that all of you need to check out. 
Um, but these are the individual tools for each section of, um, I'd say, phase of an attack or kill chain. Um, for enumeration, there's another tool called Arjun. Uh, for testing authorization, these tools are Astra, Apador, and Susanu. I want to let you know, all of you, these are all free downloads. You can go grab them for free. For JOT tokens, when I'm trying to decode JOT tokens, um, JOT tool, JOT cracker, um, JSON web token attacker, these are all cool, the great tools. Excessive data exposure, for uh, which is called API check. Um, injection, API fuzzer, TNT fuzzer, GraphQL map. Um, I'm actually going to be putting out some really cool blogs and papers on these different tools, so keep an eye out. Um, and then just general fuzzers like Rustler, Kite Runner, and again, Mac OS. Okay, so these are screenshots from my fuzzing and content discovery. On the right-hand side over here is the output from Kite Runner. You guys can see, guys and girls can see me targeting these uh, EHR systems using Kite Runner, and this is the output. Um, obviously properly redacted. Here's all. Here's the output of findings um, from my fuzzing tool, uh, Rustler. So a lot of really exciting things um, coming in that research. Here's Rustler. Sorry, I'm going way over my time. Uh, Rustler, the first stateful REST API fuzzing tool. Um, this is a very cool tool. I would recommend all of you download this and check this out. Um, a lot of my outputs from my research you've seen are from Rustler. Um, which basically does automatic uh, testing of cloud services through REST APIs, um, finding both security and reliability bugs. Uh, for a given cloud service with an OPI Swagger specification, Rustler analyzes its entire specification and then generates an execute test that exercises service through its REST API. I do want to say Rustler supports tokens, of course. You can actually insert tokens into Kite Runner as well, into the header, and this is that output. Hacking with Burp Suite. And you'll see my redacted output from uh, the interception and replaying of packets against the Fire APIs with Burp. And here's my best practices for all of you so you don't repeat these same mistakes. The APIs I've breached were previously secured behind web application firewalls. Stop using WAFs to secure your APIs. Um, a lot of these APIs I successfully breached were securing their APIs behind WAFs. Uh, these are rules-based controls use machine learning based solutions this is really important in the api space authorization vulnerabilities are everywhere remember developers authentication is not authorization you should authenticate the the api requests but make sh make damn sure that the person requesting it is not just authenticated but they're authorized and ensure that those scopes those scopes are being used with those tokens JOT tokens should have really short time to live, like between five to 10 minutes. I'm seeing JOT tokens that last too long, um, either days, weeks, or months. Stop doing that. Have really short token lifetimes. Use refresh tokens. Um, uh, but just remember that, th that um, what's neat about tokens is they can be revoked and access tokens cannot. Uh, watch out for refresh token stealing. Be careful around the security of your refresh tokens. Secure storage. I've uh, found improper, insecure storage of refresh tokens. Remember that they can be used for requesting keys. So uh, use token rotation. Hack your own APIs. And remember that Fire is a specification. Just because I'm publishing vulnerabilities in Fire APIs does not mean that Fire itself uh, is problematic or vulnerable. It's the specific implementations of this standard. So that's it. Again, you guys can download all of my research at approved.io. I'm blessed and privileged to have been a keynote speaker for this event. I wish all of you luck. Please follow me on YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter for my latest research. I live stream and publish new videos every week. And I thank all of you for being here today. Thank you, Mehdi. Yeah, thank you very much, Alisa. That was exactly what we wanted to open the second day, explaining that, yes, opening APIs for specific industry standards, whatever are, you know, it, they, it comes with the price, right? The, the price right. of like being sure everybody follow all the security principles. And actually you were showing that uh, it's not easy. And as it's not in standard, like company has to have to uh, do do the right work. 
uh, we, we, we used all our time. I, I really want to be sure you, you shared all the content. Uh, and again, Alisa, uh, we will see each other at other APIs conferences to continue the discussion. It was great to have you. And again, Alisa has a great YouTube channel. I, I really recommend you to, uh, to follow her and, uh, uh, and yes, and follow her work and her reports. Thank you very much, Alisa. Thank you, Maddie. For opening the, uh, this conference. And now 